So as, you, as was said, you know, the Holy Days will be here before we know it, and uh, that's an exciting time of the year, and, uh, and uh, we learn wonderful things about God and are reminded of his great plan, and uh, so we'll begin focusing on that uh, shortly. And in a, in, a, in a way, we're going to focus on that today, uh, an element that's uh, tied in with it to a degree. So in my last sermon, I, uh, we talked about a change between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And uh, we pointed out as you look back in the Old Covenant times to ancient Israel, God worked with a physical nation. That's very clear. He worked with that physical nation from 1400 B.C. down to the time when uh, uh, Christ died. When Christ died, he said, I'm going to raise up a new nation. And I'm no longer going to work with the physical nation any longer. So God raised up through his spirit, the uh, Israel of God, the church, and uh, we are all part of spiritual Israel. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we're actually Israelites. It doesn't matter what our race is. It doesn't matter what our ethnic background is. The church is made up of all nations, and we are joined together through the Spirit to make a spiritual nation, a holy people, a, a, nation, a priesthood that God is raising up and preparing for his kingdom. So, um, so today we're going to go over another item that has changed from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. And there are a number of items where, that have changed, and we're going to look at a, another one of those today. So the, uh, that item is, the change is noted in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12, it says, For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Now, as people are trying to do away with the law, they look at this particular scripture and say, there it is, the law has changed. What, but you have to go back and ask yourself, what law? What law is being talked about there? It says, for the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. So the law that has to be changed or is changed has to do with the priesthood does not have to do with the Ten Commandments, even though there are people that use it in that way. So with that in mind, we have to ask the question, as Christians, do we have a high priest? And, or, and is there a priesthood? And uh, what we're going to do today is we're, we're going to seek to understand those changes and to answer those questions. So I've entitled this, The Priest priesthood being changed, and, uh, and so uh, to help us to begin to answer that question, let's turn to Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. Now before we get into that, there's something we might make note of here in Exodus chapter 28, and um, what's taking place at this time. As, as and Exodus 28 is not the first thing that takes place here, but we'll, we'll get to it. Preceding Exodus 28 is the account of uh, the words God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments. He spoke the Ten Commandments, and then he wrote with his own fang finger those Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. And afterwards, uh, Moses wrote down additional instructions from God. So he gave the statutes and the judgments, uh, what in Exodus 21, 22, 23, instructions for the people of Israel. And uh, then uh, he gets to the tabernacle and begins to speak about that and the priesthood. And uh, the tabernacle he explains how that's to be done, how it's to be built, how it's to be laid out. And he's very specific. And he said, this is how it's to be. And you're to follow my instructions to a T. You're not to deviate from how this is built. It would be the the Tabernacle would be the temporary dwelling place of God on the earth as he uh, dwelled among the people of Israel. At the same time, what's Israel doing? Well, Israel is doubting that Moses is ever going to come back, and uh, so they're demanding a God, and, uh, and so Aaron gathers all their gold, and uh, as he explained it to Moses, he threw it in the fire and miraculously comes out a bull. Uh, you know, if you throw uh, 
gold or silver into the fire, it's automatically going to come out shaped like some uh, uh, bull or calf or whatever it may be. Uh, you can try that at home if you'd like, but uh, I doubt it's going to work out for you. But anyway, that's, that's what's going on down below where Moses is, where God is revealing certain things to him. So let's uh, pick up the story in Exodus chapter 28. And so we have Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. It says, Now take Aaron, your, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron, Aaron's, Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So you can look at, look at that, and you may not stop to realize that he's talking about Aaron serving as high priest, and each of these names has significance. For instance, Aaron means very high. It means very high. It means very high, and apparently Aaron's naming as a child appears to have been inspired by God. And if you go back to the book of Hebrews, you go to Hebrews chapter 4, he's talking about Christ be, being our high priest, our great high priest. Not just any high priest, but a very high and great high priest. And um, so God, as I said, inspired the name that was given to Aaron when he was young. Now, if you go to the next name, Nadab. So what does Nadab mean? Nadab means willing. Nadab means willing. And uh, so the the first high priest had to be very high. That's what he first had to be. And secondly, he had to be willing. That is, willing to perform the office. He didn't apply for the office, and uh, that's not something he sought, but God designated him to be the high priest. And so all serving as high priest had to be willing. They had to follow God's instructions, and God's instructions were very, very meticulous, and they were to be followed. And as, we'll, uh, and as if you didn't follow them, were, there were great penalties. And uh, so the, you know, the greatest penalty being death, as uh, happened to Nadab and Abihu a little later on. Now, the next name is Abihu. Abihu. Abihu's name means, my father is God, or my father is he. And... Um, uh, the high priest had to realize he was serving a higher God. And God, in, in essence, as he served in that office, was his father. If you think about uh, Jesus Christ and, and God, God is the father of Jesus Christ, isn't he? And he designates Jesus Christ as his son, as his only begotten son. So this relationship is alluded to even in the, the names that were given to Aaron's sons. So the lineage that called him into this job was really God the Father. He was responsible to God the Father, and um, yeah, even if his own father might still be alive. And, uh, and uh, his father, as high priest, was God. The next name is Eliezer. Eliezer uh, means assisted or helped from God or with the help of God. And the high priest was to understand that he was only able to do his job with the help of God. And that truth not only applies to the high priest, but it applies to all of us. Uh, we can meet any test or challenge as we are dependent upon God and seek God. We can resist any temptation and do any job that God has for us to do with his help. And the high priest was only able to carry out the function as leader of uh, the religious worship in Israel through God's help. The final name is Ithamar. And Ithamar means oasis of palms. Oasis of palms. And you may think, well, what does that have to do with anything? What does that mean? Well, in Psalm 92, verse 12, we won't turn there, but I'll just quote the part of it that, that applies. It speaks of flourishing like a palm tree. Flourishing like a palm tree. And where are palms normally found. They're found, you know, at the desert oasis. They're associated with the desert and they're able to thrive and exist in very dry, difficult conditions. And, and what the point of Ithamar's name is, it's a type of living God's way of life in a wilderness of sin. 
a, d- a difficult place to live. This world is like a desert, and we are to be like a palm tree that is able to thrive under harsh conditions. And the high priest would have to be a righteous person, even in the midst of evil. And sometimes Israel was far off track, but the high priest was to hold fast to the truth and continue to be a bulwark against sin in the nation of Israel. So all of the names mentioned in the Exodus 28 tell us something about the high priest and his office. So all of these are significant. Another thing that's interesting about chapter 28, verse 1, is this. It says, Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons. So it says he, and so what's meant by that? It doesn't say them or they. It says he. There is one high priest over Israel at any one time. But all five of these men are considered together as holding the high priestly office. One would follow the other into that office and serve in that responsibility. Their father would pass the office of the high priest down to the sons. So um, that gives us a little information about uh, the naming of the high priest. So let's go to verse 2. One of the things that is, we're told of here, let's read verse 2. It says, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, uh, for glory and for beauty. You're to make holy garments. And interestingly, there are two sets of garments. There are actually two sets. Now, one set is described here in Exodus chapter 28. The, other, the next set is associated with the Day of Atonement and described in Leviticus chapter 16. But there are two sets of garments that were worn by the high priest. The high priest uh, would wear the holy garments throughout the year, but on the Day of Atonement he wore what are called the white garments. The white garments. They were all, they were all white uh, and uh, represented uh, his, his being pure and um, <clears throat> And, uh, and his humility before God and, and his sin being removed so that he could go in before God. Because on the Day of Atonement was the day when he could go in to the Holy of Holies. He couldn't, couldn't go in there at any other time than on the Day of Atonement. So he could only go into the holy place. He had certain functions to carry out there, but he could only go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And um, <clears throat> it says in... I'll just quote from Leviticus 16, verse 4. It says, He shall put on the holy linen tunic, and he shall have the linen pants upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen belt, and with a linen turban he shall be attired. So he had on the, uh, as you can see here, the turban, he had on the tunic, he had on the, sh- the, uh, the sash, and underneath the tunic he had on the, uh, the linen pants, and they were all white. And um, it says, according to tradition, that he had two sets. He would wear one in the morning, and he would wear another set in the afternoon, uh, the, uh, two different tunics that he would wear. Because, you know, as you're sacrificing animals, uh, they tend to get blood on them and that kind of thing. So he would switch out, and he only wore them one time. Once this, the, the ceremony was over and he took them off, they were never worn again. He took them off and he left them at a particular location that God instructed and then they would dispose of them. Now, let's go on to Exodus chapter 28, verses 2 through 4, where it explains more about uh, the high priest and his garments. It says, So you shall speak to all, or you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I uh, I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. So you had people that were gifted in their ability to sew and to embroider, embroider and to construct uh, settings of stones and all of that kind of thing. People that had that skill and ability, and they stood out. God inspired these individuals to to create these garments for the high priest to wear. So it wasn't just the -the run-of-the-mill person, but they were to be individuals with great skill in these these areas in order to make these beautiful garments. And um, the Spirit of God was with them to guide them in this. 
It says in verse 4, And these garments, which they shall make a breastplate, uh, and, and uh, this is the breastplate right here, and the um, and ephod, and uh, the, the ephod is this, this tunic that goes around there, uh, and uh, the, a robe, this is the robe here that uh, he that we find there in a skillfully woven tunic. This is the undergarment that, that he wore, which was white, uh, the turban. And uh, you also have a sash. As I said, there is a sash. Now, as you, as you look at these pictures and as I research this, one idea is that he wore the sash around him and it was covered by all of this. And I don't know. And it doesn't tell us the length or any of that kind of thing. Others, as you'll see, they have the sash in front uh, around, around him. And as you look at uh, the white garments, there was no color in them at all. And, uh, and the, the garment that went, under, went over the undergarment were not pure white, but they were very colorful. And th they were colorful for a reason. The intention was to signal the glory of the spiritual high priest, Jesus Christ. It's pointing to that. These were to be garments for honor and glory, honor and beauty that were to stand out. And uh, so God inspired the, what the high priest wore, and there was a point and a purpose to this. You have to realize that as you look in, in the Old Testament and you see the temple or you see the tabernacle and these things, God didn't just say, hey, let's just put this in there for the fun of it. It has absolutely no meaning. Let's just put it in there. No, it has meaning. And it's pointing you to something that ultimately played out in Jesus Christ and was fulfilled in Christ, as you understand it. And uh, it is quite significant for us. So as you look at this and you understand something about it, then you get a glimpse of what God was ultimately going to work out. Let's go to uh, Exodus 28, verse 5. It says, They shall take gold, that was thread that was made from gold, you shall take gold, uh, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine limit linen. So you had thread that had all of these different colors in it, and it was to be very impressive, that, that thread that would add this, this brightness and glory to the, uh, the outfits. And so you would have um, a thread that was made of uh, gold, golden thread, blue thread, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. And uh, this is just an indication here on the screen of what that thread looked like. Now, <clears throat> so that was used to weave everything. Now let's look at uh, the ephod. The ephod. In chapter 28, let's look at verse 6. It says, And they shall make the ephod of the same thread, gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine woven linen artistically worked. So they were to make this thread and they were to make uh, the garments. Uh, the, the ephod is discussed here. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its edges, and so it shall be joined together. So you have these two shoulder straps here that uh, would be joined together. So you would, uh, the, the way it's portrayed here, you would pull it over your head, and then you would, you see the flaps on the, the right and left, these flaps here, then you would fold them over and that's where you would find the uh, breastplate. And inside of that went the Urim and Thummim, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. So um, it shall be, have two shoulder straps joined at its edges and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod which is on it shall be of the same workmanship made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and the fine woven linen. So you, uh, this is the ephod, and he was to wear that, and uh, uh, it was kind of like we would uh, uh, have a, a tunic that you would wrap around you. Let's go to chapter 28 and look at verse 9. Chapter 28, verse 9. And um, then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. So on the shoulders, you had two, on, uh, two onyx stones. And you had six of the nations of Israel on the uh, right shoulder and two and six on the other shoulder. All right, and these, so 
as you were the high priest, you carried Israel on your shoulders. It was symbolic that he was the one that carried Israel on his shoulders. And as you go forward in the New Testament, who carries the Israel of God on his shoulders? He still carries the Israel of God. So he carried them on his shoulders, and um, they had the names of the sons of Israel uh, engraved on each stone, six of their names on one stone, and six names on the other stones in, order, in the order of their birth. So it went from the oldest to the youngest, and they were engraved on these two stones. It says in verse, uh, verse 11, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his, sho his two shoulders as a memorial. So as you think about our relationship with God and Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ bears Israel on his shoulders, and um, he bears their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. He still does that. This was all a type of what's to come, and he bears them on his shoulders. It says in verse 13, you shall all make, also make settings of gold, and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords, and fasten the braided cords to the two settings. So you see the braided cords here of gold that were attached to the signets on each shoulder. And they came down and they were attached to the ephod. Now let's uh, go to verse 15 and uh, look at the breastplate. Exodus 28, verse 15. It says, you shall make the breastplate of judgment... You shall break, make the breastplate of judgment artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, purple, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. You shall make it. It shall be, shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length and a span shall be its width. So it was basically 10 inches by 10 inches. A span is about 10 inches. It was the span of a hand. Mine may not be 10 inches, but that's a good average. So... This uh, breastplate was about 10 inches, excuse me, that's, that works, but about 10 inches square. And uh, let's just go on to that. 10 inches square here. And um, it says, uh, it shall be doubled and uh, 10 inches square, verse 17. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And uh, ver verse 20, and the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold ses settings. So these were precious stones. And each of them represented Israel, a, na a nation of Israel. And they were, you know, they're Precious stones, which is indicative of the fact that Israel is precious to God as well. And the, the high priest carried the nation of Israel not only on his shoulders, but over his heart. So God has a deliberate reason for making these associations with Israel and the shoulders and the heart. And um, you shall make a change for the... Breastplate at the end, like braided cords of gold, and we talked about those. They, they are connected up here to the edge of the uh, breastplate. And you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings that were, that are, which are on the ends of the breastplate. So we see that God uh, established these things and, uh, and uh, they symbolized great things for Israel, and they pointed to the future of things that were ultimately going to work out. So you have these 12 stones that are part of the breastplate. What's interesting is, let's go to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And you have to realize, think about this, this is revealed to Israel in 1400 B.C., the, what the high priest was to wear. 
and these stones that are to be uh, in the breastplate and all. All of this is revealed in 1400 BC. However, you don't get Revelation 21 until 180. That's a 1500 year span. And this gives some clarity to what those things represented. They didn't know. They may have had a glimpse, but they didn't know fully what we know and what we can see. Revelation chapter 21. And let's begin in verse 18. So this is talking about the new Jerusalem. Talking about the, the Jerusalem to come. Revelation chapter 21 verse 18. The construction of its wall was of jasper. And, and we don't exactly know what the stones were that God revealed. We do know there were stones. They were precious stones. And, uh, but it's thought by most commentators that the stones that are mentioned here in Revelation 21 are the same stones. Revelation chapter 21, verse 18. So you have the, the its wall of jasper and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald. So the, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold and transparent like glass. Now, so the, the, these 12 stones are mentioned here by the Apostle John, and, uh, and he's, he's seeing in vision the New Jerusalem, uh, which is a spiritual city, the Bride of Christ, and uh, the city has these same stones around it. And we have uh, something symbolic that the high priest wore, but he didn't understand what it represented. As I said, he was given the instruction. Moses didn't understand it. It's revealed later what this is all representing. Jesus Christ, as you look at the city, is the chief cornerstone. And the foundation is, are the apostles and the prophets. And as I, as I said, most people feel that uh, these stones represent what we see here as the foundation of the city of God. Four rows of stone in, in the breastplate, each one for a tribe of Israel. And as you realize, as you look at, at the leaders of each of the tribes, you're going to have an apostle who is a leader for each of those tribes. One of the apostles is going to be the leader of a particular tribe of Israel. So we have this interesting parallel that Jesus Christ as the high priest of the New Jerusalem was symbolized by the high priest in ancient Israel that was wearing these stones of the tribes of Israel. And, uh, and it's interesting, what, what was the shape of the breastplate? It was square, wasn't it? And what's the shape of the, the heavenly city? It's square, it's a cube, isn't it? So that's uh, coming and uh, going to be a, a, a wonderful thing as uh, it's ultimately played out. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. So, the book of Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul because there was a transition that was taking place. And for the people that were Jews, that were Hebrews, this was all very difficult and perplexing for them. They had practiced, they had had a high priest since Aaron. All the way down to the time of Christ and even beyond, they had had a high priest. They had sacrifices, they had a tabernacle and ultimately a temple. They had all of these things and they were used to a particular way of worship. And with the death of Jesus Christ, all of that was going to change. It wasn't meaningless, but it was going to change because as God laid all these things out, there was a spiritual intent behind it. And this spiritual intent become, begins to become clear as you understand what's taking the changes that have taken place and who is now the high priest. So this is uh, Hebrews 1 begins to give us uh, some important differences between Aaron and Jesus Christ. Let's begin in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. 
It says, God, and is speaking of the Father, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by, uh, spoke to the fathers by the prophets. So God inspired prophets and they spoke to the, God's people. Verse 2, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So he's spoken to us through Jesus Christ. He's no longer speaking through prophets. He's speaking to us through Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ spoke to us through the word of God. Verse 3, who being the, the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, all things by his So through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of our sins. He purged our sins. In that way, he was our savior and redeemer. And then he was in the grave for three days and three nights, as uh, the, uh, the story of Jonah reminds us. It was the sign that he was the Christ. And what happened as he was resurrected and ultimately returned to heaven? Then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he rose from the grave. He spent 40 days working with his disciples, and then he rose on high. And uh, he remains there to this day. So what's he doing up there? What's he doing up there? What's his purpose? What's his role? What's his responsibility? It says that having become so much better than the angels as he is an inheritance, by inheritance, obtained a more excellent name than they. So he's on sitting at God's right hand. And uh, he has a very important function. Verse 8, it says in, in, in chapter 1, but to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions, more than any other human being that, that lived. He's been anointed and exalted above them. And he's been anointed. He's been anointed as king, of kings, but he's also been anointed as high priest. Because as you go through the ceremony that took place with the high priest, he was anointed with oil to take on that responsibility of high priest. So here in the, we have in the first part of Hebrews indication that Jesus Christ holds both offices. He is both king and he is high priest. And as you go back to the time of Aaron, was Aaron the king? Aaron was not. Aaron was the high priest, and he had that office alone. And the high priest was never the king. And as you go, you look at Moses and Aaron as they led Israel. Who was Israel's king? God was their king, and he was to be their king. And he was their king all the way down to the time of Samuel when they said, we don't want God as king. We want a real king physical king that we can see. And what does God tell Samuel? He says, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me as being king over them. And they were given a physical king. So um, if you go back to Aaron's time, Aaron was a high priest. He was not the king. Now, there was a time when uh, the uh, high priest was the leader in Judea, but he wasn't a king. I uh, never was. So let's go back to Exodus chapter 28 and think about the ephod a little bit. Exodus chapter 28, and let's look at verses 29 and 30. Exodus chapter 28, verses 29 and 30. It says, so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment and over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. So whenever he is serving as high priest, he has the breastplate on his chest and he wears it as a memorial before the Lord continually. Verse 30. And you shall put the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. So Aaron shall hear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before the Lord continually. 
So Aaron was given responsibility of making judgments. And um, later Jesus Christ will be given tremendous judging power. All power in heaven and earth will be given to him when he returns. He will judge between the sheep and the goats. But you know, when uh, Aaron is given the judgment and, um, and uh, served as a judge in Israel uh, for on certain matters, and, uh, but Jesus Christ, as he came the first time, did not administer judgment at the time. In fact, uh, he, he wasn't administering judgment in a physical way. When a man came to him and said that his brother was not dealing fairly with uh, their inheritance, Christ said, who made me a judge over you? But Christ did make spiritual judgments. Remember the woman caught, caught in adultery, they brought her to Christ and they accused her and, uh, and Christ said, uh, he who is uh, clean, you cast the first stone. And uh, so he did make spiritual judgments and he told her to go and sin no more. And, um, and uh, Christ will be a judge when he returns. He will judge all things as we're told in John 5 verse 22. The Father will give him judgment in all things. And uh, he will not only be the high priest, but he will be king of kings and lord of lords. Let's look at verses 34 and verses 35. Verse 34 and verse 35. Now, until I you know, did a study on the high priest and their garments and all of this kind of thing, I never realized how much God liked pomegranates. Okay? I mean... And, and I, I think when I was a kid living in California, I may have had a, a pomegranate, but not very often. So after I went through this, I thought, well, when they're in the store, I'm going to buy a pomegranate, and I'm going to try a pomegranate. So I immediately stained things that I had on uh, because I did not know the technique for getting all those little seeds out of there. But um, it, it is interesting what God likes, and God uh, apparently wanted the pomegranates to decorate uh, the bottom of the tunic, the blue tunic that the, the priest wore. It says, beginning in verse 34, it says, a golden bell, so all around the bottom of the tunic were these golden bells, and a, and a pomegranate. So there was a golden bell, there was a pomegranate, golden bell, pomegranate, alternating all around the bottom of the tunic, and upon the hem of the robe all around them, and the tunic was blue, and then you had the bells and the pomegranates at the bottom. And it shall be upon Aaron when he ministers, and its sound will be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, that he may not die. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave it, and uh, that we'll talk about that in a second. So he had the uh, pomegranates along the bottom of the tunic. So whenever he was going about his duties in the, the, the te temple or the tabernacle, you knew he was in there because you would hear the tinkling of these bells. So... Uh, you could hear them and as uh, he went about serving God and representing the people. Next up, we have the uh, turban, which is, uh, uh, let's begin in verse 36. It says, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. So uh, along the front of this, it said, holiness to the Lord. And, uh, you know, it's up, up on the forefront of his head, on the frontal lobes and is to represent where he's, uh, his mind is at, that he is a representative of God, and he is to conduct him in a way that is in harmony with being a holy representative of God. He, we are to be a holy people. That's to be on the forefront of our minds as well. So it, uh, it says, So it shall be on Aaron's forehead and that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their gifts, and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. You shall, and so this is, uh, this, this is the, he wore a turban. This is blue. I'm not sure it was blue. It looks, looks good, but I think it was actually white. But uh, I found the best pictures that I could to try to represent things. Now let's uh, move on and begin to look at some things here in the New Testament. Something interesting here takes place in Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And Acts chapter 7 uh, describes, uh, uh, describes something that took place here. And, um, uh, and, and 
interestingly, Stephen understood what was taking place. Jesus Christ gave his life up at, at Passover. The last thing he said in John chapter 19, verse 30 was, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. It is finished. What I came to accomplish with my first coming has been accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit, and his spirit returned to God. So he gave up his spirit, it is finished. So all of those things that were pointed to in the old covenant, the sacrifices and uh, the high priesthood and the priests and all of that, that was, that was finished at that point. The tabernacle, the temple, that's all over. That's all over. Now, he understood that. The disciples came to understand that, but the Jews in general did not. They did not understand that it, what had taken place. So, so when that event took place, the priesthood was changed, and what took place, what dramatic event took place there when Christ died? With his dead, death, the, the veil, which was thick and impossible to rip with human hands, was ripped from the top to the bottom. And you have to realize that that veil represented that man had no access to God's throne. As you stop and think about it, there was one person on the face of the earth. One person on the face of the earth from the time the priesthood was established until it was finished that could go in to God's throne room on an annual basis. That's it. One person that was the high priest. But with the death of Jesus Christ, that veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, that veil that had the cherubim on it that represented being cut off from God, like in the Garden of Eden, God put the cherubim out there and said, you cannot enter the garden. And that was there always to represent that man had no access to God's throne. But with the death of Jesus Christ, it was ripped from top to bottom. And man now had access to the throne of God. We all have access to the throne of God. God has opened that way for us. And um, we can come before God's throne. And it, it's interesting what took place here with Stephen. Stephen in Acts chapter 7, let's begin in verse 54. Stephen understood certain things, and, and basically he was talking to the leaders, a group of, of a, a, a synagogue here, and, and laying out certain things to them. And uh, he tells them that they've always been a stiff-necked people resisting the Holy Spirit. Usually when you tell people that, they, hey, thanks for telling me, we were really off base. No, they never react that way. They're ready to, who are you? Who puts you in charge? How can you judge me? Is usually what we hear. And they talked about them persecuting the prophets and killed the Messiah. You killed the one foretold who, the, who for, killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. You killed the Messiah. And then he goes on to say in verse 54, uh, verse 54, he says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. To me, I, I've always wanted to see what it means to gnash at him with their teeth. I don't know what, you know, whether they're growling like a dog and, and uh, snapping at him. I don't know what that was. They were cut to the heart and gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He saw this in vision and he relayed what he saw to them. And he says, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. This was outrageous. Outrageous because they recognized this didn't fit with their understanding of the role of the high priest in the temple. They still believed that God was, was in their midst and God was still working in and through them which wasn't the case. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. But he saw Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. 
And these people were so fixated and focused on the temple and its ceremonies, they couldn't accept what he was telling them, that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. But that's exactly what he's telling them. And in the book of Hebrews, he gives us quite a bit of detail on that. There's a reason why the priesthood is spoken of in Hebrews so much. God is relaying the significance of this to the physical, through physical Israel and also to all of us so we understand what it represents. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, and verse, beginning in verse 9. Verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He died to taste death for all of us. But then he has been raised to glory and honor, that he might be, uh, by the grace of God, represent us. So he's been raised from the dead. He is to come as King of kings and Lord of lords. But as I said, what's he doing up there at God's right hand? Verse 10, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So he came to the earth, he lived in the flesh, he experienced what the flesh is all about. He knows what pain is all about. He knows what it means to be hurt, to be betrayed. He knows what it means to lose a loved one. He knows all of these things. He experienced them. He experienced the flesh. And, uh, and he, by experiencing that, it makes him more capable of bringing many sons to glory. Uh, make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. You mean he wasn't perfect? He was perfect in every way. However, he had not been a human being. But he came to this earth and experienced it and was able to understand what it's like to be a human being. And that's crucial for you and for me. And um, for both, in verse 11 it says, For both he who sanctifies, that's he who sets apart, and those who are being uh, set apart are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We are his brethren. We are his brethren. And you know, as, as most of us would go, from, go to the limit to serve somebody that's our family, Jesus Christ is the same. We are his family. And so he represents us and advocates for us and wants the best for us uh, at all times. As you, let's go to chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. And through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. So he came to eliminate the power of death. And you have to realize that uh, uh, the devil is constantly coming before the throne of God seeking to slander you, seeking to point out to God all of your faults, where you've fallen short, where you're off base, where you're wrong. And he wants God to punish you. He wants God to punish you. But we have an advocate at God's throne in Jesus Christ. And he came and part of his purpose was to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Bondage to sin, having the death penalty hanging over their heads. And Christ advocates with the Father that the blood, his blood would be uh, placed upon us to cover our sins. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. We are Abraham's seed, as we are in the faith. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. He knows what temptation's about. He know how, knows how hard it is to deal with that, and he represents us before God. He understands all of these things. When you, so when you go before God on your knees and you ask that God would be merciful to you, a sinner, and that, you, that he would cover your sins, 
Jesus Christ is there at your right hand. And God may say, well, what do you think? What do you think? And Jesus Christ advocates on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle. Christ was the, an apostle. He came from God and brought God's message to man. And high priest of our confession. What is your confession? It is part of your commitment to God at baptism. And baptism, and you renew that covenant every year at Passover. We made a confession to God that we accepted him as our God, that we had repented of our sins and we were going to walk in that path that he lays out for us. And uh, Christ is the high priest of that confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was faithful in all his house. Verse 3, for this one, that is Jesus Christ, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he, he who built the house has more honor than the house. Verse 4, for every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterwards. Yes, Moses was faithful in, in building the tabernacle. Moses was faithful in making sure the garments were done as God laid them out. And Moses sought to rightly represent uh, the, you know, himself as uh, God's representative to the people of Israel and vice versa. Verse 6, but Christ, Jesus, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, we are his house. We are his house, the, the Israel of God. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope to the end. God has given us a wonderful plan that he's working out. We're part of it. And he says, you can be a part of my family forever. But we have to hold fast to the end. Understand what we've been given and hold fast to it to the end. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And look at verses 14 through 16. Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hold fast to it. Hold fast to what we committed to at baptism. Hold fast to what we renew every year at Passover. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, without, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this is open to us. All of this representation of the ripping of the, the veil into open the way that we can go into the throne of God and we can go in there anytime. So no matter what the trial is or what we're facing or the difficulty we're having, we have the right to go into God's throne, we can come boldly before him. Could the high priest do that before the change? He could not. He could only go in there once a year. And if he went in there at any other time, he was dead. But we can go before God. That way has been open to us. And we can go to God with any matter and ask for his strength and his wisdom and his guidance and his protection. All of the things that he offers. We can ask for his forgiveness and so that we can have a right standard with him. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 7, which talks about another aspect of uh, the priesthood here. Hebrews chapter... We're not going to Hebrews 7 yet. We're going to chapter 5. Let's look at chapter 5, verse 1. It says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for... Four men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weaknesses. So God established a high priest, and he could understand human weakness because he was human himself, and he had his own weaknesses. 
Verse 3, because of this he is, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sin. So Abraham was human. Abraham sinned. And before he could go before God on the Day of Atonement, he had to make sacrifice for himself uh, and his family before he could begin making offerings for the nation of Israel. And uh, Aaron didn't seek this office. God designated him as high priest. And it wasn't because he was perfect. He was anything but perfect. He's the guy that was making the golden calf for Israel. And were his sons perfect? No, they weren't. Just think of Nadab and Abihu. They decided to do things their own way, and they were killed as a result of going that direction. So Christ is our high priest, and, uh, and God has appointed him to be our high priest. And he was chosen by God to be that high priest. And let's go to look at verse 7, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. It says, who in the days, or verse, let's begin in verse 6. It says, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So he is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And one thing that you have to realize is this. The first time we meet Melchizedek is back in Genesis 14, when he came out to meet Abraham after the slaughter of those who had invaded the land of Palestine and taken Lot captive. He came back. This priest came out to see him. And it tells us something about him in the book of Hebrews here. And, you have to, and one thing that's interesting is, if he was high priest then, after the order of Melchizedek, then he didn't become high priest just after his death and resurrection. He was high priest all along. But they set up the high priesthood in order to teach Israel certain things. He came in the flesh, he rose from... The, the grave and went to return to God's right hand and assumed that position once again. Now let's go to Hebrews 6 and look at verses 19 and 20. Hebrews 6 verses 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. He is an eternal high priest. He will always serve as high priest. And he's serving us as high priest now. And he's going to serve as high priest in the millennial kingdom. A spiritual high priest. And uh, as you look in chapter 7, it talks about Melchizedek, king of Salem. He's called the king of righteousness. What human being is the king of righteousness? He's called the king of Salem or the king of peace. Who is the king of peace? Do we have anybody like that today? He's also called, um, you know, talks about he has an endless life. Who, Who fits that other than a divine being? Jesus Christ is our high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now let's go to chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 20. It says, and inasmuch he was, as he was, was not made high priest without an oath. So as you look at, at Aaron, Aaron was made high priest, but God did not make him high priest and accompany his establishment as high priest with an oath. But he, he took an oath in establishing Jesus Christ as high priest. So for they have become print priest without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And what is he a priest of? Let's go down to chapter 8, verse 6. 
It says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant. A better covenant, which was established on better promises. It's a better covenant because we aren't given just physical promises and blessings. We are giving, given spiritual promises and blessings. And as it says that they're, they're better promises, the promise of eternal life, that was never part of the old covenant. But that's the promise that has been given to you and me. And Jesus Christ is the mediator of that covenant. Surprisingly, neither saints nor Mary are part of that mediation process. That's a manufactured by human beings. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and begin in verse 18. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 18. It says, now there is no, is, there is remission of, now there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So once your sins have been remitted, there is no reason to have an offering. Therefore, brethren, having the boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So it's pointing to the fact that the veil has been rent and we have access to God's throne. By a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil. That is, his flesh. Through his sacrifice, he opened the way to God. And having a high priest over the house of God, a high priest over the house of God, he is our high priest. We are his house. And he says, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He's there at God's right hand, and he is serving us as God's high priest, as, as God's representative, as God's high priest on our behalf. So as you go back to the old covenant, you realize that it was pointing to the new. And there were things that you could learn by studying the old and better understand what's playing out in the new. Think about this. If you did not have the old covenant, how would you understand any of this in Hebrews? You wouldn't. You wouldn't understand it. But because you can put the two together, old and new, then you can make sense of it and see how magnificent and wonder, wonderful it is. So as we look back to the high priest in the Old Testament, he was dressed in vestments for honor and glory. He was, uh, in a physical sense, that was meant to represent what a, a glorious state. But he was human, and Jesus Christ, our high priest, is more glorious, powerful, and ever lives to make intercession for us. And we have access to God's throne through him. We can come boldly to God's throne at all times. And let's finish in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, and this is a, I always like this uh, representation of the high priest because it's colorful, and I think it gives you an idea of what they were trying to achieve, God was trying to achieve, was something colorful, and when you saw it, you would say, wow, what an outfit. It sparkled, and, and you know, you had the Urim and Thummim in there, which worked in some way to light up and answer questions so that judgments could be made. So let's, let's conclude here, beginning in verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. We have an altar that those who serve in the tabernacle, that is the high priest and the Levitical priesthood, they have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest are, uh, for sin are burned outside the camp. So they would make the sacrifices, take them outside the camp and burn them. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the camp. So they took him outside the camp, whatever that means, which I'm not going to explain today. They took him outside the camp and executed him. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. We go outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. 
We seek something better, seek something eternal. Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips. So we offer praise to God. We, in a sense, serve in a priestly role in that particular way. And it's pointing to Christ going outside the camp and things that are available to us that the Jews wanted nothing to do with. They wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't get it. They will come to understand it in, in time. So hopefully this uh, gives you a better understanding of a change between the old covenant and the new. The old high priest was done away with, but the new high priest, Jesus Christ, is our high priest, and he is always there to allow us to go before the throne of God and to intervene on our behalf. And it is a great and wonderful blessing to con consider. So thanks for your attention. Hopefully you found it profitable.